Aruna Roy, Harsh Mandar and Urvashi Butalia. Hello friends, welcome to this session called The Right to Know. I cannot tell you how privileged I am to be on stage with these two stalwarts of the long movement uh, to bring in what is perhaps the most important piece of legislation that independent India has seen, the Right to Information Act, and the ways in which this, this Right to Information campaign was built from on the ground up uh, and pressure was brought on a reluctant and recalcitrant state which somewhere mysteriously had decided that its citizens were its enemies rather than people who had worked together in the nationalist movement to create a state of our dreams and to create a constitution which guaranteed the freedoms that the state then jealously guarded and did not part with. So we're going to talk about the right to know, but we're going to focus a lot on the right to information, which is a part of the right to know. And I think that discussion has never been more important than in today's India, where all kinds of voices are being stifled and people seeking information are actually being imprisoned and arrested, and all kinds of fake knowledge is being created. So all of those are connected with the issues, and without further ado, I am going to begin the conversation. I don't think Aruna Roy or Harsh Mandar need any introduction at all to this audience, but very briefly, one of the things the two of them have in common is that both have been civil servants within the government system in India, and both left out of a disillusionment with that system at different moments in their lives. Aruna, a long time back, Harsh after um, the 2002 violence in um, Gujarat, and both then concentrated their energies on living and working in the environments that they actually wanted to change. Both are writers, both are activists, both are strongly political beings. Um, both have located themselves in, as I said, the realities that they uh, wish to change, wish to live with, wish to own. Both are nationalists in the best possible sense of the word. Patriots in the best possible sense of the word. We all might question that word, but there is a side to it that many Indians, when, we, when India was created or when India became independent, would have owned, and I think those are the sort of values that uh, both Aruna and Harsh live by. There's much, much more to their um, achievements, lives, personalities, which I will not go into because you can look it up on Google and we'll save a bit of time. So um, I'm going to ask both of them to come in briefly initially with opening remarks on to tell us a little bit about the importance of the right to knowledge, to information uh, on the part of citizens and the ways in which states actually see that as a threat and hold on to that information. So Aruna, if you would like to start. Um, and we're going to have a kind of free-flowing conversation. Of Glad to be here because uh, Harsh and Urushi are very old friends. I've known them for a long time. And I feel everyone in this room are also, in a way, fresh acquaintances, but we'll travel this one hour together. Um, I have always been perturbed. Actually, I resigned from the IAS just a few months before the emergency was declared in 1975. And um, 
I've always been worried about a system of governance which doesn't tell people what it's doing with their lives. It's got steadily worse, by the way. And I think probably now, at this time, we are at one of the worst periods in our lives. But when I went and settled down in central Rajasthan in a mud hut with uh, rural people to understand how democracy could grow from below. But I've always believed, and I've met some wonderful people in rural Rajasthan and in rural India who are the best Democrats. They want democracy, they want it to exist, they are, but they, are crit they critique it and they are critics of it because it hurts their right to life. So we had two very important slogans when we um, uh, began the right to information campaign and it arose from a demand for wages for very poor people. And the government said that they, they didn't pay the wages and when we asked to see the records, they told us they were secret documents. So that began the real battle for transparency and accountability. Harsh was involved with us right from that moment. He was, in fact, teaching at the Civil Servants Academy at that stage. He came down and he said that this is, I, I want to be part of this. I mean, I want to know because he had also tried. And we were trying. So we pooled our energies together. And uh, one, uh, since this is a literary festival, uh, two uh, lines from a lyric a Dalit friend of mine wrote um, when we were doing the agitation, um, illiterate, poor Dalit man. And he, battling with the system, sang a song which became viral in those days in Rajasthan in which he said, um, pehle wale chor to bangle mein rehte the, aaj kal ke, uh, pehle wale chor to jungle mein rehte the, aaj kal ke chor to bangle mein guz gaye hain, raj choran ka. Then the second couplet was, I'll start soon translate, the second couplet was, pehle wale chor to bandook se maarte the, aaj ke chor to kalam se maarte hain, raj choran ka. He said, the decoits of old used to live in jungles but the decoits of today live in bungalows. And the second thing he said was, the decoits of old killed with a gun. The decoits of today kill with a pen. Our country is ruled by scamsters. So it was uh, this kind of movement from below that energized us and we had, I'm going to hand it to Harsh in a moment because I bring him in in many ways, and I think it was so important, we had a big sit-in in a town called Biawar in central Rajasthan. And at that time, there were, um, the, for those 40 days, we sat there, but we were very creative. And in that period, uh, we also formed a campaign. In that period, we got people from all over the country come. And at that time, Harsh also came. And I remember he was still in the civil service, and I asking him, Harsh, do you want to be announced? Because you are still a civil servant, you know, that so-and-so has come to support the campaign. And he made a, a wonderful statement, which, is, well, which I'll never forget. And he said, I'm first a man of the people. Secondly, I implement the constitution. And the third, uh, after all that, I'm a government servant. I hope I'm not misquoting you. If I am, Harsh will correct me. So it's that kind of cross-section of society that joined this campaign. It became a huge campaign. It, uh, ad it entered into advocacy, it framed the law, and bargained with the law, with succeeding governments. And finally, the UPA won, passed the law. And of course, now it's a book called The RTI Journey, which Rowley has brought, up, brought out. And I know they had to deal with a lot to get this book out because it's a collective book and we wouldn't, no single writer, no author, this, that, and all our bargaining with them, but anyway, it's out. So it's there in which Harsh is really quoted because he's written so many wonderful things about us. Now, I think Harsh should uh, tell us what he Harsh. feels about it. Uh, thank you, Aruna and Urvashi. Uh, uh, privilege and uh, joy to be with you on, on this panel and with all of you here. Um, I believe that uh, the single most important 
reform of governance that has occurred since independence has been the right to information. Uh, and its significance was, again, summarized by, uh, in, in, in this same rally, I think, uh, a young, uh, unlettered uh, Rajasthani woman uh, spoke, and she said, uh, I'm just translating, she said, who, uh, who are the, uh, who is the king and queen of this country? And then she said, we are. Then she said, who is the government? And then she replied herself, she said, the government is our Munim. Munim is like somebody who, and then she said, when I'll say it in Hindi, she said, agar Raja Rani Munim se hisab nahi lete hai, aur phir tijori khali ho jati hai, to koon zimmedar hai? Raja Rani hi to zimmedar hai. To Raja Rani ko, uh, so it is, it, it, it is the duty of people who, are the rulers in a democracy to hold their governments accountable. And, 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 and uh, in the years that I was in the service, uh, I, I, there were moments, I, and I'll very briefly describe one, where we had a close to a famine. India has not seen full-fledged famines, but it was uh, a massive drought in the late 80s. And, uh, I was posted in a district, and night and day we were, we were trying. We, we had about 100,000 people on works in the Simba district, and I was trying to ensure that no one dies hungry. Towards the end, I was posted to the end of that season, before the rainy season, I was posted to another district, and, which was also affected by the famine. And I started traveling around as one does, getting familiar. And everywhere I went, there's supposed to be a tank here, which was built but there was no tank. There was supposed to be a road here, but there's no road. And after about 10 or 15 days, I realized that, the, that massive amounts of the famine relief money had actually been eaten up. And what would happen is that the rains would come, and then if anyone did a verification, they'd say, oh, it, it was there, but it all got washed away. So I said, I will do a full-fledged inquiry into uh, this, and it all hell broke loose. The entire set of public representatives in the state uh, in, the, in the district resigned and said that if there's an inquiry, uh, I will, uh, we will all resign and I insisted on having it. The long and short of it was that uh, there was 18 crore rupees that had been spent, of which we found that 10 crores was just not there. I mean, it just wasn't there. And this was 10 crores of money which, which was meant to, to, uh, to keep alive people who were uh, starving in a famine. And it had just been eaten away. And I, I then started sending people to jail, and, uh, and I was transferred out. Most of my uh, in the IAS stories end up with I was transferred out. <laughs> but, uh, but, and it was three months from joining. And when I left, I was just wondering, what kind of country is this that, and that was about the time of Bofors. Bofors was 80 crores, and this was 10 crores. It was one eighth of Bofors in one district, money that should have gone to keep people alive. And I said, what is, you know, how can we have a democracy where, you know, people are allowed to starve and, and there's nothing they can do about it? And, and that's when I heard about, Aruna was an old friend. Uh, I used to volunteer when I was in college and in Telonia. And, and I heard about this work, and I, when I went there, I said, this is an idea not for a few panchayats. It is really an idea that can change Indian democracy, and, 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 and the rest is history, as all of you know. I just wanted to make one more point, that, that we often think about the right to information to hold government accountable for corruption, and financial corruption. But over the years, we've realized, I've realized that we have to hold government accountable for a lot more and particularly in the times that we live in uh, and we are passing through with rising hatred and communal violence and so on. I had my, perhaps my best experience with the right to information was in the post-Gujarat uh, uh, massacre uh, when I decided to leave the civil service and we started working uh, with, with the victims and fighting hundreds of cases. And at that time, the, uh, the, the atmosphere was completely fraught and opaque, and the police uh, and the administration right from the very top, uh, uh, led by Mr. Narendra Modi, uh, I, saw, uh, I saw that the government was completely complicit 
and supportive and enabling not just of the violence, but also of what followed, which was ensuring that nobody got punished. And we didn't know what to do. We couldn't get out even the b basic papers. And then we started using the RTI. And I had a whole set of Muslim victims, working class. They learned the RTI, and it gave them the kind of power that they could now walk into a police station and say, I, you know, uh, I want to know what complaint you registered. I said this. What, what would tend to happen is that I would go, and very reluctantly, even if you file my uh, police complaint, I would say A, B, C came and set fire to my uh, house or raped my daughter. The police would record an anonymous mob came and, and did this. And I would have no way of knowing. So we started just saying, I want a copy of what you have recorded in my police complaint. I want a copy of my statement before the police. And it changed things so fundamentally. And, and that showed the power of the right to information uh, you know, to hold government accountable for corruption, but here it is to hold government accountable for its most basic constitutional duties. And therefore, I think it is, it is something that every Indian uh, needs to hold on to and re recognize what that Rajasthani woman said, that hum hai Raja Rani, aur hum hai apne munim ko, uh, uh, unse hisab lena hai, hisab sirf paison ka nahi, insaaf ka bhi, insaniyat ka bhi. Kanun, uh, everything that the Constitution has promised, hold the government accountable and use this power. Thank you, Harsh. Uh, Aruna, let me uh, come back to you with, uh, so you talked about building the campaign and you talked about how Harsh came from the start and, uh, and how he spoke and what, how you introduced him. Um, what I want to ask you is, so, you started your own work in Dev Dungri, and then the actual campaign took root in Biawar when you started the 40-day dharna. How did one? How did you actually mobilize? What were some of the tools you used? How did you get people around you to understand the importance of the kind of information and having knowledge about their rights and the information that they could have? And what were the tools that you used? Because this is pre-internet days. So, um, you know, how you're mobilizing, going out. And then you, the, the campaign grew with the entry of people like Harsh and others inside the system who were sympathetic. What was it that drew them? How did you manage to involve them? I mean, the, the scale and the reach, and it's not, you know, it's so easy for the state to ignore something that's happening in a small village in Rajasthan. So to get the attention of the media, the state, every, how, what were the tactics that you used? You know, I, um, you would be surprised that I was invited to be a professor of practice at McGill University to teach a course. And I was wondering, what will I teach there? I am an activist. But anyway, I thought I'd design it as practice to theory. Because that's what, that's what my life has been. And I didn't have to tell people what and how important information was. They knew it. Because they died because of lack of information. They, uh, they went through penury and hunger because of corruption. So they knew that there was something suppressed by the government which hurt them. A very simple story. Sushila went with us when we presented the first draft made by the Press Council of India. The chair was Justice Savants, retired from the Supreme Court. And Prabhash Joshi, Ajit Bhattacharji, and Kuldeep Nayar, and Nikhil Chakravarti, big names in Indian journalism, went and put pressure on Justice Savants, saying, you have to chair the committee to draft the law. The inputs came from us. Uh, there were civil servants who draw, drew up the first draft under Harsh in the National Academy. Yeah. N.C. Saxena was also there who contributed one famous line, which we still carry in the law. Uh, we had certain principles that could not be denied for citizens' right to know. All this went, and, and that finally the law came to be, and it was presented to the, to the media. So we went, as we always do from Rajasthan, and... 
rural Rajasthani women, as you have seen here, wear skirts and veils. And Sushila went dressed like that, class four. That's all she's passed. But terrific woman, terrific. When she's with me, I am 200 people, not two. She's magnificent. So Sushila came and then the journalist, and again, I'm going to break into Hindi and translate. The journal, one journalist asked her, Tum kya karogi yahan pe? Kitni badi likhi ho tum? Tum jaanti ho? Kis ke baare mein baat karne aayo? She said, Main chauti paas ho, Main jaanti ho. Arre, kanun to koi nahi bana sakta, Bade bade padhe likhe, Log fail ho gai, Tum kya karogi? To usne kaha, Ki mein apne bete ko Das rupay dhe kar, Bazaar bhejti ho, Vapas aata hai, To mein hisab leti ho. Ye sarkar mere naam se Arbo kharbo rupay kharchti hai. Hisab nahi loongi kya? Hamara pesa, hamara hisab. She said, when she was asked by this journalist, why, do you think you can make a law like the Right to Information Act? How much have you studied? She said, class four. He said, well, you can't do it. People much more learned than you have tried and failed. And then she said, you think so? When I send my son to the marketplace with 10 rupees, and when he comes back, I ask for accounts. This government spends billions of rupees in my name. Won't I ask for accounts? It's our money, our accounts. So slogans. Should we shout the slogan? Okay, in English first, uh, I'll say our money and you say our accounts, which is true with government, with IMF, with the World Bank, with anything, it's our money, you know. So it's not India. Our money. Our money. Hamara paisa. Hamara paisa, hamara hisab. Hamara paisa. So that was the power that went through. And there were many such slogans, the right to know, the right to live, many others. The other thing was that this town of Biawar went crazy with the right to information thing. We got money, we, we, are, we don't take institutional funding, so everything is crowdfunded. The town of Biawar gave us 80,000 rupees in cash. This is 1996, so they gave us cash. The villagers brought grain, four kilos to a household. So they got involved. So about five, six hundred villagers around Biawar, they brought grain, which we ate, because we were 200 of us sitting every day. And then the local vegetable vendors, the, everybody, the local newspapers started writing about us. Water had to be bought, so people donated drinking water. All the uh, houses of, well, Dharamshalas, travelers' lodges, all opened out to us because we had to bathe somewhere. We were sitting on the street. Today, if you ever pass Biawar, in Chang Gate where we sat, the municipality of Biawar has put up a memorial to the RTI. Wow. It's a stone, it's a granite, huge granite stone with a hole in it. So when we inaugurated it three years ago, the same editor of Nirantar, who was the editor of the newspaper who wrote about us, when he came and spoke, he said, you know, normally statues have heads. But this is a monument with a hole in it because it's a people's law. So whoever goes behind and puts his head through the hole is the maker of the law. And it met with so much response because we, we thought it was too abstract, you know, because it was just that the information had made a small hole <laughs> in this huge slab and much had to be done. So it's that kind of thing and songs and all these things. And of course, they finally, one woman who was a member of the uh, municipality at that time came and said to me, you better get the law. So I said to her, it's not in my hands, it's in the hands of the chief minister of Rajasthan, you better go tell him. But I said, why are you so insistent? She said, you see, the whole of the, the entire town has uh, bet on the loss or the gain of this particular protest. <laughs> what do you call it in English? I don't know. Hum to kehte satta baji kela. To was satta kele, gambling on it. So it was satta. So she said, I have put my money on your winning it. So you better win the law. So this is the kind of involvement that happens when you sit in a public place and that's why it's so critically important that in India today, we have access to those public spaces. And that's why it's such a disaster when a place like Jantar Mantar, which is in Delhi, 
was uh, completely taken away. And then, of course, MKSs and other organizations went in a writ to the Supreme Court, and we've got it back, yeah. but with some terrible conditions. So it's this kind of thing that really makes us um, be part of it. But anyway, I'm going to jump and come back to the post the book. We had the first launch in Biawar. We thought we must go back to the people. So there's no point having the first launch in Delhi or Bombay. We have to go back to the people who helped us write the book. And we went there, and uh, <laughs> they said, oh, the protesters have come back. We call the protesters there. Hindi mein kehte dharnarti aage, dharnarti aage. So the same chai shop who gave us subsidized tea, the same nimbu pani wala who gave us subsidized nimbu pani, everybody was there. And everybody rejoiced in it as their gift to India. And in that, when we sent this to friends, one of our friends who was to be the editor of the Hindustan Times in Jaipur, Vipul, Mudgal, he sent back a text to my friend saying, I've heard of book releases with cocktails. I've heard of book releases with all sorts of things. But I've never heard of a book release with a protest. Because all the people on the street were protesting. It's that kind of ownership of the law. Today we have between 6 to 8 million users of the law every year in this country. So it's a huge number. So people own the law. And I think that's the ownership of the law. Hmm. And going much beyond the movement, the campaign. And of course, we squabble like hell. Because everybody thinks this is wrong, that's right, this interpretation, that interpretation. And Indians, of course, love to argue. We are the argumentative Indians anyway. So, uh, but nevertheless, I think this is what uh, the law managed to do. Managed to do. Actually, Harsh, I was reminded when Aruna was talking of um, something that happened with us as publishers. You're aware of this book that we did on the Kunan Poshpora rape case. This was a case of army rape that took place in Kashmir in 1991, uh, which kind of just disappeared um, into some uh, well of silence and nothing ever happened. And Kashmir was one of the states that originally was out of the purview of the RTI, but then it is now within it. And the RTI arena was used to reopen and source information uh, about the case and then to file petitions in the courts to reopen the case. And when the book came out, we launched it in Srinagar. And it was the same sort of thing. Uh, the protest was, the launch was marked by protest and not by cocktails. And the survivors of that case were there coming to own the new life that this movement that was created has given it. I wondered if you could talk then about, you know, uh, different states owned the RTI before it became a fully fledged national act. Different states implemented some very interesting aspects of it. And those were also possibly due to some enlightened people in government or state ministers. So could you talk a little about that history? Uh, you know, in the government, uh, I used to teach in the academy and I used to tell my uh, young trainees many things. But I said the longest journey of your life is, is the journey from that side of the table to this side of the table. And somehow the moment you come onto this side of the table, you forget what the world looked like when you were on that side of the table. And, and, and that if you can keep remembering, and you know, it's been Quite amazing. I've had, uh, I'm to date, uh, because both of us were in the IAS, uh, I a little longer than, than Aruna. Uh, a lot of civil servants still tell us that you were the ones who let us down. Uh, you betrayed us in many different ways. Switch sides. You switch sides, which we did. Uh, but I, I keep, you know, again, in, to my students, I used to say that, that we, we normally look at a line like this, that this is government and this is non-government and, and this is where the divide is. But why don't we draw a line like this? That these are people who believe in constitutional values and these are the people who, who oppose it. And therefore then we are partners and, and, and the line of in and outside government doesn't matter. But most of all we, we draw a line like this. But I just wanted to sort of start with, with a very funny conversation I remember had uh, with, with a colleague who, who was saying that uh, you guys have created so much, uh, you know, made life so difficult for us. Uh, after all, and she was saying that I take strong action and 
uh, which of us does not misuse our vehicle, official vehicle sometimes? And uh, I immediately get uh, an application saying, I want a copy of your logbook. And then I, uh, you know, I am in a problem, etc., etc. So I was smiling and I said, yes, you should not have misused your, your vehicle and so on. So I said, is, it, is RTI a completely terrible thing? So she said, no, actually, sometimes it works very well. Because earlier when uh, there's some positions in government, like when you go abroad, you know, when you're given a foreign posting, it used to be done in a completely opaque manner. People started using the RTI within the, you know, on what grounds was so-and-so officer given this. So now they have to go through a very transparent process. So she said, that worked well. So, 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 so when, when you are the, uh, you know, uh, when you're the, uh, the, 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 on the receiving end of state power, you, uh, uh, you want the right to information. When you are wielding state power, uh, uh, you are uh, uncomfortable with it. And I think that that, that plays out in, in, in many different ways. Uh, I, uh, because of uh, seeing this, uh, after the academy, I got posted back as commissioner in Bilaspur. And I decided I won't wait for a law. I'm going to pass the first set of orders, administrative orders, uh, 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 for the right to information. And it was, it was quite fascinating because I had to understand. So for instance, in the public distribution system, grain used to be sold in the in the black market so i said what but every piece of grain that is sold in the black market is shown to have been distributed to somebody who has a ration card so i figured out if i say anyone can get a copy of what is called the distribution register uh, it'll change things and i remember just passing that that was the first order ever actually and i said that anyone can take a copy and there was uproar and I, I realized that you know I, it was the you know I, 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 the right thing yeah. to do, and uh, this is part of the record. Within a month, the amount of offtake of that grain went down. I forget what percentage. It was something like thirty percent or something, which people just stopped selling in the black market. And then you realize the power of it. And Arna and all had come actually to Bilaspur then. And just to give another example, young people. Uh, you know, apply for jobs and they don't know uh, what. So I, now of course you can ask for RTI on what, what basis. I had said that anybody who uh, has any concern about how a particular appointment was made can ask for what is the copy of what were the uh, criterion and the, the, the qualifications, what were the uh, applicants and their qualifications and how did you select this person. And then that was something that led to my transfer from from Bilaspur, because the, the, the local minister, I didn't even know, the local minister's son had got appointed as uh, a lecturer in a college f against a position where he wasn't, he wasn't even qualified in the subject for which it was, and, and so on. So, you know, you realize then, and, and those were those first baby steps when we realized how powerful this instrument, and, and when six, eight million people are, are reading, I was seeing the study, and uh, it was very interesting that in rural areas, almost the entire set of people who have applied, uh, a, a overwhelming percentage, are, are below the poverty line. So it's not just that, that, that people are using it, poor people are using it, disadvantaged people are using it, and they're seeing it as an instrument of democratic uh, uh, power. Uh, but I just, again, wanted to bring it down a little bit to the times we live in. Where but can I ask you yeah. also, because yeah. you mentioned this, while to address the question of how central the right to know is to democracy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, uh, so again, having worked within the system, the entire, how do you derive power uh, as a government servant? It is by not allowing people to know uh, what you are doing, why you are doing it. And each of us, I mean, those of us, even people from privileged backgrounds, well-educated, just how do you feel when you enter a government office? Uh, there's this sense of nervousness, there's a sense of not knowing where to go, not knowing how long it's going to take, who you have to meet, how that person is going to treat you, etc., etc. And I realized this power, I mean, this uh, going back to the Gujarat one, I had the majority of 
of, of peace workers that we had, we called them Aman Patiks, were, were people, uh, working class Muslims uh, in Gujarat at the worst of 2002 to 2004, 5. Uh, it's hard to imagine what it means and the kind of fear that they were living with. For th they discovered that with the RTI, uh, they would apply and people would get nervous and it started happening that the, the constable would say, uh, the inspector would say, Are, just take back the application, I'll just give you the information. And then they started telling, telling me that we, we now walk into a police station and they offer us a chair and they give us a cup of tea uh, and they give us the information and they tell us, you know, and we negotiate. And, 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 and that's, the, so, so when you breach uh, why the, the right to know is so central to a democracy is that power is, after all, if you use power as a, as a trust for, the, for people of disadvantage, everything that you do has to be, would be open. You, you won't need to, uh, uh, to hide it. If I'm using my power arbitrarily uh, uh, or, uh, you know, either in corrupt ways or I feel even more significantly in other unjust ways, uh, then I need to hide. And that is where my power lies. And that's why it's so central to democracy. Uh, but I was saying that we're living in, in the times that we live in and because uh, one has to keep going back, uh, we're, we're looking at governments now not only holding back information but actually transmitting consciously false information. And, uh, and the arc from Donald Trump to uh, uh, our own prime minister, I mean, there are many things that are, are similar, but this idea of continuously telling you stuff which is absolutely not true. Uh, and so we, we are actually swinging from the right to information to uh, the recipients, the, the passive, confused uh, recipients of official fake news. Disinformation. The of dis the, 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 yeah, so, so, so disinformation. And, and, and the second is that speaking out the truth has always been unpopular in our country. Uh, but, but, but there was still a space. It was quite interesting. Both uh, Aruna and I were part of the National Advisory Council. Yes. And, uh, and I, I, you know, it, it's un, unpopular to say this, but, but the one person whose name one needs to mention in this story is also Sonia Gandhi. Because uh, uh, whatever one might, you know, when history looks back, it was, without that political support, this would not have, have come, come into being. Uh, but there was a space, even till then, when both of us, I, I write regular columns, I used to be, Officially, the NAC was part of the Prime Minister's office, and I was writing severely critical articles about the Prime Minister in, my, uh, in every column of mine, and I was still advising the Prime Minister, and there was a space to doing it. We are, we are so rapidly closing those spaces, and so public speaking out, public dissent has become an extremely perilous, uh, to the, the, the cliche of speaking truth to power, uh, or, in, in simpler words, trying to share and the right to know uh, in these conf confused uh, and, and increasingly oppressive uh, environment to, 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 to try to shine a light has become extremely dangerous and we are seeing uh, uh, the term urban, urban axle. Uh, it started off with five-star NGOs and it went on and on into, uh, uh, it's now the urban axle. And, and when somebody, when Mr. Sambit Patra actually said that about me, I didn't even know what, what you know, I, I normally don't want to respond. But I thought I needed a response, so I, I said, put out a tweet saying, by your definition, uh, anyone who stands with the poor and the disadvantaged is a naxal, and I take your charge as a, as a badge of honor. But we are seeing people have been sent to jail. Uh, Anand Tumbud K is, is the most recent example. Uh, for speaking the truth. So I think when we're talking in a session about the right to know, we really need to talk about how difficult it is to, to, to speak to people so that they have the right, they can enjoy the right to know. Thanks, Harsh. 
Aruna, I want you to come in on this as well. I know that you have been really concerned, and, and well, all of us have, about the ways in which the right to dissent, uh, which is also an essential part of our constitutional rights, has been threatened, and the ways in which fake information has been fed. I just want the organizers to tell us this monitor is not working, so I can't tell how much time we have. Does, do you, can you just put that on so that we know we can... Okay, all right, okay. So we still have a good 25 minutes. So Aruna, if you can come in on that. Uh, I really feel that the right to information campaign has educated people about democracy in understanding how critical information is to being a free citizen. But at the same time, we are appalled at the ease with which evidence and misinformation is manufactured and passed off as the truth. I'm equally perturbed and disturbed by the literate Indian taking it as gospel. There are not enough of us questioning that kind of evidence and that kind of manufactured truth that's given to us. My real worry is that we will lose the wood for the trees if we don't concentrate on the misuse of power by the state and the double speak that really confuses us in India. Because you speak a language, the political class, the ruling class, now speaks a language which is very ethical, but its actions belie it. So we have to have the per perspicacity to puncture that somewhere and to see that it's not true. Those who amplify the voices of evidence from below, which says it's not right, which says those claims are not true, and who particularly come from areas in which there is a kind of a development paradigm, in which there's investment, and where there's a history of Maoism, have really suffered. So anyone who amplifies a voice of this kind, and it needs to be amplified. That's why we have a great lot of us called activists. When we amplify that voice, we are termed urban nuxials. Because they don't want those voices to be amplified, because it shows up the lack of truth in what is being uttered by the state. This is done always. I'm not saying it's a new phenomenon, but the intensity has gone up. Anand Teltumbre, a friend of ours whom Harsh referred to, is a scholar who works on big data in the University of Goa. And the latest has been Anand, who has been told that he is uh, working against the state and there, thereby possibly will be accused of sedition. Now, this is very worrying for an information activist because information of any sort can be termed seditious. If you ask my local revenue official who gives me information about the ownership of land, will tell you that we are all anti-state because we ask for information from his records about ownership of land where it's gone against the law. So what is sedition? It's not defined. And hold an opinion, and that's where I think I'm really also equally worried, is that you can hold any opinion, provided you don't put violence into action. You can, be, you can think of a position which is not Gandhian and still be totally a patriot. You can still think of India. You don't have to be seditious. You don't have to be a terrorist if you think some, uh, somewhere violence must be used. Take the death penalty, for instance. There's so much division amongst us. Many of us think it should not be there. But many people think it's the only way there will be a control over violence uh, of the wrong sort of murder, of rape. I don't think it ends it. But there are many who think it's the... So there's a debate on. So when you close the space for dialogue, and when you say that a certain kind of thought itself is seditious, we are on very dangerous ground. It's 1984, it's Brave New World, 
It's all of that put together and any other horror stories that you may have of where we just don't have any freedom. Uh, everything crowds around you. So it's my worry that all of us activists, information activists, there's six million of us or eight million of us who think we are fantastic because we've got the right to information law. We have to understand that our entire law derives from the Constitution's Article 19, which gives the right to freedom of expression. Yeah. So if you don't have freedom of expression, you're finished. And I'll just end with a quote from a very famous South Indian poet called Subramanya Bharati, who died long ago. And he wrote this beautiful poem in Tamil in which he said, speaks as an old woman who's dying of hunger, who says, I don't have gruel and I'm going to die. But more important for me than not having gruel is the right to say that I don't have gruel. Because though that's the only way she will get help. So they are very astutely cutting off the nerve that really supplies democratic rights to all of us. And that's why right to freedom of expression is the principal article for me because it leads to all the other articles and it's a transformatory article. And that's why right to information law has also been called a transformatory law by Mr. S.R. Shankaran, who was for Harsh and me, a great mentor. So this is, I think, uh, it goes against everyone in this room who believes in the right to freedom, to write, to have an opinion, to argue, to dissent, to disagree. So today, the spaces for disagreement and dissent in India are fast shrinking. And believe me, 20 years ago, if you told me that this would happen, I wouldn't have believed it. Because I really thought it was a country where you could stand in India Gate, that it's in Delhi, and shout against the Prime Minister of Delhi and get away with it. But today, it's your social media. Today, it's your emails. They want to have access. They already have access to all our emails. I'm sure our phones are tapped. So we can't make a, have a conversation. And now I hear that even the WhatsApp will be tapped uh, and people will know what we are saying. I mean, this is a kind totally against the right to know. The right to know of the citizen is what we call right to know. The state has to be obliged, obligated, and it should be, it cannot have impunity. The state must be ruled by us if we are the sovereigns in this country, as uh, Hush quoted that village woman from Rajasthan saying that the state is whom? It's not a hereditary state. It's a voted elected state. So the elected state has to and absolutely must be accountable to us. So as we speak here today, the people of Rajasthan have got together to pressurize the government of Rajasthan to pass an accountability law so that if you do not, do not act on your promise, there will be a penalty. It goes on and on, of course. So that's why we are called activists, that's why we are called strugglers, we are called whatever. Because from one achievement arises the need for many others. Harsh and I are both going to that meeting from here, actually to discuss the second tool, of legal tool we need, to make sure that we retain all that we've got, to make sure that the citizens of this country get it. Because these are not issues for individuals, but for everybody. And I think, Again, I go back to Biawar. They say that we made this law and we gifted it to India. And they say it's for every citizen in India that we thought. So it's a wonderful way to feel about a law empowering people. So the right to know, therefore, my dear, is fundamental to all of us and therefore the right to freedom of expression. And this tension and nervousness that's come into people today of being worried as to whether they could say it or not say it, uh, is for me a complete turnover from what happened because civil servants participated in this law, political parties gave us support, and I remember Mrs. Gandhi, Sonia Gandhi, in that council pushing the law and really pushed the law, but there were also the, some of the other political parties, like the left political parties, which prevented the amendment to the law. Six months after the law was given to us, the party that gave us the law wanted to amend it because they, reali they realized how strong it was. And we were on a protest in Delhi and the entire opposition led by a former prime minister and the left came and they supported us. 
So it's been from political parties, it's, been, it's drawn everybody together. And I think democracy is hard work, friends. <laughs> you know, if you have a king or queen, you can surrender to them. If you have a dictator, well, you have no choice. But democracy demands from all of us some amount of hard work. And I think to know what's happening to our lives in those laws they pass in parliament, the fine print we never read, which we sign on, all that is actually very, very important. The British left is saying, which of course, uh, from colonial times, saying that the devil lies in the details. And it really does lie in the details. So when a law is passed, you can't just say, oh, it's a good law or a bad law, like many other laws that have come since the RTI, which have restrained the use of the RTI, have put a greater burden on all of us. So we have to be abreast of everything all the time. All the time, firefighting all the time. I, um, I think there's a lot more that we can talk about, but I do want to open it up. I just want to flag something that it would have been good to talk about if we'd had time. Um, one was the fact of how empowering the right to information and the achievement of the, of the law can be, but at the same time how fraught with danger um, it is. And also we've talked a lot about access to information from the government, but really other institutions, private, corporate, others should also be held accountable and the same sort of law should apply to those. So perhaps those are next steps. Let's just open it up. This monitor saying 10 minutes, is that all we have now? Okay, okay, so we can I think maybe take three or four questions. Um, okay, can we see, um, there's too many hands. Um, I'm going to do some gender choosing also. So, um, sir, you in front, can I see if there's any women asking questions? Is it going to be all men? No, yeah, there's a woman there at the back, there. And that gentleman who's standing up, and who? Yeah, we got, we got two women at least. We'll take four questions. So, sir, please, can you start? Yeah, sure. And be brief, please. Um, I must apologize for my limited knowledge, but when I come to these countries, I try to understand the local politics. Um, and my understanding of, in, of India and, and, and this major barrier to freedom of information, the freedom to speak out, the freedom to um, protest, is the institutionalized corruption. Does India really need stronger anti-corruption laws? I believe they're quite weak. Thank you. Um, at the back, who was yeah. that? Hello. Yeah, that, yes, sorry, you've got it, okay. I'll see, let's see. Please speak, please. Um, both of you were in the bureaucracy and both left it to achieve something which is so major for our country. But as bureaucrats, I see that you were shunted out and posted out. Could you not make a difference then? And is bureaucracy really relevant then? I mean, what is the role? If you're calling the political class the kings and queens or the rulers, then I personally feel it's the bureaucracy which kind of implements the rules and empowers the people. It's politicians come and go. So do we really need a bureaucracy? <laughs> okay, thank you. And at the back, yes, please. The gentleman standing up in that brown jacket. Ma'am, uh, my question is to the panelists. Do we need RTI part two? This question is asked under the light of a news item appeared uh, uh, which uh, uh, says 65% of the government uh, program Beti Bachao Beti Padhao Abhiyan was spent on advertisement and the rest of amount was also allotted to some other sectors and the real work was done almost uh, uh, very insignificant. So, how to enforce this, uh, this act, RTI, uh, in letter and spirit, how to make the executive accountable? This is our money. They are the munims. They okay. have to spend accordingly. Okay, thanks, sir. Can we take, we'll take one yeah, more. I want to just actually, yeah, Arunan Harsh, a very big thank you. Who is saying both this? of you, you stand there. I mean, you're there representing a whole group of 
activists who have you know, dedicated your whole life. I just want the both of you to share with all of us what keeps you both going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just take one more, this young woman. I'm sorry, we can't do too many in the third or fourth row at the back, yeah. We've got five minutes left and they'll respond, then we'll see. Ma'am, uh, very good afternoon. Ma'am, I'll be speaking about the most deprived section of the, our society. I'm speaking about the Saharias of Bara. Now, uh, what about that land which was got free by you and it is again taken back by those uh, landowners. When I visited the area, I am a researcher and uh, again the land has gone in the hands of those sardars. So, okay, okay thank how you. Th the de Haan, ji, bilkul, ma bilkul. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. So, would both of you like to respond? I really want to apologize to all of you who have questions. I'm sorry, but we just don't have time. It's the monitor. Mere samne hota, I would have figured it out, but my apologies. Please. Very quickly, we need a bureaucracy. We need implementers, but they must be absolutely transparent and accountable. You can't have a bureaucracy which is opaque and in camera. And they've been excellent civil servants who have contributed a lot in this country, but it isn't part of the system. And we need a systemic, honest, and committed bureaucracy, which will never happen. So you need the power in the hands of the people so that they can monitor them, and then everything works more or less. Because you know, if you see, see uh, the, uh, the older versions of uh, information, uh, Rajiv Gandhi said, only 15 paisa reaches the village. Today, we have 60 paisa from the rupee, which is 100 paisas, reaching the village, which is not bad after transparency. But we've lost 70 people. 70, more than 70 RTI users have been killed in this country yeah. for asking for information. So we must balance that off. I'm going to leave the anti-corruption law to Harsh, but I'll quickly move on to the, um, uh, what was the uh, next the question? The second RTI is important because, you know, when you bring out the transparency laws, don't promise you action. They just tell you what's inside a government file. But when you find out that there's a crime, and then it goes into the usual regulatory mechanism systems, which are also corrupt. So you never see justice. To get justice, you need the accountability laws. And what keeps us going, I think, I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just worry, concern, anxiety, empathy, uh, a feeling that so long as you can do something, you must do it. Looking at the poor people in Bara or in or the Dalits fighting with their backs against the wall, I'm privileged even though now I live with them and I don't earn a salary and I don't do this and don't do that, but I am privileged and I'm a privileged Indian. So do I have the right not to do anything? Which is what all of us have to ask ourselves. So I think we do have to do something to at least for our own conscience and I don't think I've ever done it for anybody else. Whatever I've done, I've done for myself, for my own faith and belief, my own ideas, and my own conscience, which never lets me sleep. So that's, I think, the most important thing, because when there's a violation, the right to freedom of expression, I have real sleepless nights. And so I think that's what makes me. And about Bara, thanks very much for the information. I think the young woman has left, but I'll certainly look at it. And tribals have also benefited, Dalits have benefited. So we must look at what the information law can do for them. Yeah, I, I just have a minute, so uh, let me very quickly telegraphically respond to a couple of things. I, I love the years I spent in the civil service. Uh, and for any young person who is thinking about it, if you're willing to stand up for what is right, uh, especially the early years uh, serving in, in, in the poorest parts of India, you can implement your beliefs in land reforms, in gender justice, in caste equality. Uh, being fair uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a time of communal violence, etc. My deep, uh, the reason I chose to leave because is because I'm seeing that we are passing through a period where the constitution itself and its core is being challenged. And there are many battles you can fight within the four walls. If, if our disagreements are within the four walls of the constitution, you fight within the system. If our, if our 
battle has to be to preserve these four walls, then you have to be an independent citizen. And that is why I felt I needed to be outside, uh, uh, free of any power. Uh, one other quick one, I think, maybe to the question that you asked at the back. You know, the challenge is, is, is increasing. I'll, I'll just give you one simple example. Jobless growth. We are just not getting the information. You know, even last night I was watching. It is true that this growth model is not throwing up jobs. Young people, we're adding a million people to the workforce every month. They have every right to aspire. And we were promised that it doesn't ma matter if some people, the super rich, get super, super, super rich. They'll create jobs. Everyone will be better off. I want to know from my government, you promised that they, there would be two crore jobs every year. How many jobs have been created? And there's such deliberate, continuous, uh, you know, lying around it. So I think that, 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 that and political party, I mean, they've created now a, a, a format in which a donation to a political party by, uh, by a corporate uh, house now can remain anonymous, which never was there earlier. So, so we are we are we we haven't we are seeing governments which are wanting to withhold information despite uh, the right to information, and I think that that is uh, is something that maybe you all would like to you know what Arna said so beautifully. Democracy is hard work, and we all need to keep holding on uh, to saying that 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 we were promised, we the people of India were promised a country which belonged equally to all. Uh, a country which would be humane, which would be compassionate, which would be egalitarian. Uh, if it's not happening, uh, you and I are also complicit if we remain silent and passive. Thank you, Harsh. Um, friends, we have to close. I want to thank my two wonderful panelists. We've just touched on the tip of the iceberg of this really important movement.